I'm Chaplain Eric Doolittle. Welcome to Faith Ant, conversations about life, belief, and everything. Today, we're talking about life, faith, and Lent with Mario Jace. Mario Jays is a graduate assistant in the Office of Student Involvement here at North Central College as he works on his master's degree in business administration. As an undergraduate here at North Central, Mario was the president of Catholic Cardinals, a residence assistant, and on the presidential search committee. I'm always interested to talk to Mario because of the way his faith plays out. And as we explored Lent, filming the day before Ash Wednesday, I thought it was important for us to explore what that can mean for him and how that plays out in our world. Thanks for being here today, Mario. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. So let's just start a little bit thinking about uh, what Ash Wednesday is Mm -hmm. and how it fits. Like today is Mardi Gras, also, you know, Fat Tuesday or Carnival or Shrove Tuesday for some folks. Uh, And a lot of people forget that that is the day before Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday is the first day of Lent. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason that people like Mardi Gras or how that developed was you got a time to kind of enjoy all the fun things that you might be um, giving up for Lent as part of your disciplines. Um, And so we'll talk a little bit about like what Lenten disciplines means and how you practice those. But I just wanted to kind of review for folks who don't know what, how the calendar works on all of that, because it's kind of complex. Uh, so Lent is a symbolic 40 days before Holy Week or Easter, depending on how you count it. Mm-hmm. always starts on a Wednesday, and it's always the six weeks before Holy Week, which is then Palm Sunday, and then Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter Resurrection Sunday. Mm-hmm. And those move because the they're dated um, based on a... a calendar that is actually based on the sun and the moon. So Easter is the date that gets set. Easter is the first Sunday after the full moon, after the spring equinox. It just rolls off the tongue, which is also how they date Passover Mm -hmm. uh, in the Jewish calendar. So those two things are linked together. And so once you set Easter on that Sunday, then we go back and say, okay, where does Ash Wednesday fall? Uh, and that's why kind of those two dates yeah. move around, but they're always parallel to each other. So to, tomorrow is Ash Wednesday, and uh, there's a couple of different things that we've got going on. I know that um, the green scene has taken on uh, Eco Lent again. Okay. They brought that back this year, if you remember, uh, where it was how do we think intentionally about our impact on the earth, and you know maybe look intentionally about how we recycle, how right. we reduce those types of things, and kind of linking that as a discipline. And we see lots of people who take on different disciplines to say, I want to try and be more intentional during this time period to get ready for the the celebration and the uh, marking of Good Friday and and, uh, Easter. So uh, for you... um, what does that look like? Like, what does what are you planning on taking on this Lent? Have you have you made your uh, decisions? Yeah, so I was bouncing back and forth with it, and of course, growing up, I was like, I'm going to give up candy. And like, yeah, okay, great job. And then because like, for saw, kids, what on can Sunday, be Sunday? I'd go crazy on candy to be like, this doesn't count in the 40 days, right? And they'd be like, yeah, okay. that's right. Sundays are always a feast. So day. yeah, um, and then it got up to soda, and then it'd be like, well, now I don't even have candy or soda because mm-hmm. of the things that I gave up. But this mm-hmm. year, I wanted to kind of switch it and not be like, I'm going to give something up, but more so I'm going to do mm. something. Because mm-hmm. um, I always tell people like, oh, you could do something or you can yeah. give something up. And of course, it might change and it might be both. But yeah. I was trying to be intentional about like doing something for someone to like affect their life in a positive way every day. So it could be small, could be big, but trying to, for 40 days, every day do something for someone. And of course, if that gets paid forward, it passes on. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't, then it's like, okay, well, I'm doing my part. But it was kind of in the realm of Lent, you are trying to live like Jesus and be like Jesus. So my thought was, well, instead of giving up, how can I try and be more engaged in that kind of life? So that's the plan for this year. Oh, I, I think that's really commendable. That's, you know, that that 
intentionality, I think, is so much a part of any sort of a discipline. And, you know, for some people, giving up, just giving up something mm -hmm. um, is pretty easy. Uh, my grandfather, who was raised in rural West Virginia, um, and so would grow his own vegetables and fruits and didn't have access to what we have today, mm -hmm. every year for Lent, he said he gave up watermelon. Mm. Um, which generally in February in West Virginia was not that big yeah. a stretch. Um, and so sometimes it can just kind of be a, 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 yeah. a thoughtless, oh yeah, I'm just following the pattern so I don't eat sweets or I don't drink caffeine or I don't eat fish on Fridays. Yeah. You know, it's a very, another one that a lot of folks practice during this time. Mm -hmm. But that idea of I want to practice something, I want to take something on, is is more intentionality in that. Mm -hmm. So when you think about Jesus and trying to make somebody's day better, right? How do you touch somebody's life? Um, what are some of the ways you think we can do that on campus? Like, where are those opportunities for us? Yeah, for sure. I think a, a big thing could just be like general support, mm -hmm. um, as much as like asking someone how the day is going, but like noticing that most of the time it's not going well. And instead of them saying like, it's fine, being like, oh, okay, well, like kind of digging a little deeper, mm -hmm. although it can be like an uncomfortable conversation. Mm -hmm. I feel like just kind of with the state of mental health and being more aware of it now, it's like, well, you can dive a little bit deeper sometimes and realize that someone's going through it, or that someone might need more of a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that's a big thing, especially on campus right now. I mean, even just diving into like Lent time, is what, midterms. Mm -hmm. So like that's a big time where you see a lot of stress and Although that might be a thing where maybe someone is religious, might push all the religion aside, and maybe that's something that you can kind of even try and introduce, and that could be your good deed to be like, have you prayed on it? Have you thought, how can I embrace God in this moment where I'm struggling? So, mm -hmm. of course, not forcing it on anybody, but also showing, like, this is a very positive kind of outlook you could have on life when you bring God into whatever you're struggling with. Yeah. I love the first piece of that, which is just intentionally paying attention intentionally listening to people, which is in and of itself so unusual. Um, Parker Palmer, who's an author that I enjoy, says that uh, real listening is a holy gift. Mm -hmm. And we often see in the scripture where the when someone does have an encounter with Jesus, there is so often a lead off of him actually listening and paying attention to them mm -hmm. and then responding from there. So I think that that in and of itself is something that can be very intimidating mm -hmm. uh, because we don't know what might be going in somebody else's life and we don't want to pose on them. Yeah. But we might have an opportunity to, to just give that little bit of extra space within ourselves and within the day to say, hey, I... Is there something else going on? Do you give that opportunity? Yeah. And it's not to pry, but just to say, hey, I'm open to that. It might just take that, another question. They're like, okay, well, this is going on. So, yeah. yeah, it's just something. Yeah, it's just a little something that can make all the difference. Um, how do you balance that out for yourself? You know, you're in a role where you've got a lot of people coming to you. You've got a lot of interaction with students. You've had that kind of a position on our campus for a long time. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that out for yourself of what people might want to put on to you? Mm -hmm. and, and how do you not carry that? And how do you keep yourself centered? Yeah, for sure. I mean, one, the self-centered is faith, but we could dive into that. But um, I've always been very, like, service-driven. So very much like, what's going on in your life? How can I help you? How can I assist? So I've kind of become used to just always being open and seeing when people are struggling and when people can have a lot on their plate to just jump in. Um, so that's been, of course, throughout the North Central experience as well, being like, oh, I noticed that you're struggling because this isn't what you're used to or it's more than you were expecting. So kind of being ready to jump in. Mm -hmm. And of course that evolves every day to something different. Um, what I've been more so lately is just trying to be like, when I go home, I'm home now. Of course, I'll still answer some texts and emails because if it's enough to get a text, it means they're thinking about it more than they should as well. Um, but just trying to really unplug and be like, when I'm here, 100% plugged in, 150%, like, let's complete everything we need, but also being able to be like, I'm home now. 
Um, and after, you know, we've spoken and stuff and just trying to kind of create that little boundary for myself. So it's definitely been positive. Um, but just from just being overloaded in general, I feel like I've always had the aspect of faith to kind of turn back on and just think about the day, always sit back and start everything. We're just thankful for everything that goes on throughout the day. I'm starting the morning that way, being like thankful for waking up, for everything you did for me yesterday. Um, give you full permission to use me however you need, Lord, for today. And then kind of ending the day, being like, thank you for this that happened. I might have been stressed about this, but thank you for that because this came from it, or maybe I don't know what came from it. Usually the next day I'll think back on what happened the previous day, and I'm like, okay, makes sense. Let's work on that today. So, yeah. Yeah, that practice of, of gratitude, of just being thankful for what we've got and that we have the opportunities uh, is sometimes overlooked, those, those small things. Uh, kind of like you're trying to give small gifts to other people mm -hmm. uh, to just say thank you. It's really what a blessing to be part of this. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any, uh, you know, there's more formalized disciplines that are often part of the Catholic tradition. I don't know if we talked to, I think we mentioned that Catholic Cardinals is where you're coming from, so mm -hmm. that you're Roman Catholic in, yes. in your identity. Um, do you have any more of the traditional practices that people would put with that that are part of your life or that you use? Yeah, for sure. So one of the main things is like no meat on first Ash Wednesday and mm -hmm. then every Friday. Mm -hmm. um, Easy ask, but man, on Friday, does it feel like I could really go for meat? And then Monday through Thursday, it's, there's not, not a thought in the world of having meat, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, it's kind of Stations of the Cross and just stepping yourself through the life and the passion of Christ mm -hmm. and kind of what you're working towards um, instead of kind of just loading that all up on Easter. Uh, same with like rosary, Bible study, um, just the general like almsgiving, just trying to live through Christ, right? Um, and so are those yeah. things that you try to do regular, daily, regularly, sometime during this time period? Like, what does that pattern kind of look For sure. Like for so not just Lent alone, but like rosary, I say every way, every day on my way to school. Because it's like a 35-minute drive, and I could fit it like perfectly in the 35 minutes, right? Um, so that's, that's a daily thing, and I feel like whenever I miss it, I feel like, I don't know, brain foggy, just not like I'm on for the day. Um, church is usually weekend. Sometimes we'll go during the week. Uh, depends like holy days or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, meet, of course, is just the weekends. Yeah, right. And then trying to dive into the Bible more, but um, more so focusing on specific sections and revisiting them mm -hmm. compared to just, I'm going to start here and I'm going to finish the whole book. So I've, I've tried that method. I get distracted very easily. Right, and then I'll read it, and I'll be like, I know there was something good in there, but I don't remember what I just read. So now trying to be like, this is the section I'm covering. Let's really dive into that and like what's being said here. How can I focus on this for a good period of time instead of just being like, oh, that was good, highlight it, and then flip the next page because my Bible is highlighted and sticky noted. I think that's allowed. That's not surprising. <laughs> As yeah. an engineering mind to kind of look at things and want to find deeper connections and things like that, it doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Um, you mentioned using your car time, which is really interesting to me because that is a theme that I'm hearing from a lot of folks nowadays as a time that is, you know, you're by yourself, you have a lot of control over the environment. Mm -hmm. And so I think of, I don't think I'll, I'm doing him any disservice, Michael Mays, mm -hmm. who talks about, you know, he'll listen to gospel music and sing mm -hmm. and, and really as, have those intentional um, ref, you know, moments yeah. of, of, an, uh, of really feeling God's presence in that. And so I think it's really interesting to, to see how that time, people are using that time mm -hmm. uh, as, hey, I've created this kind of space. You know, that it reminds me of the, uh, there's these ancient traditions of the, of, you know, cloisters and cells for people who are, you know, take on religious orders mm -hmm. as kind of, I have this space where this is. You know, and literally we're sitting in, in a space like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, a chapel is a dedicated space that, not, you know, other things happen in Coton Chapel, but it is, this is a space that is controlled for this. Is that a challenge, do you think, for people? And, and, I, and I'll move into, like, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's a challenge for people to create time and space for those intentional moments to 
you know, get with the, the spiritual encounters that they need? Yeah, I think so. Um, especially in like the busy college life and just the whole like day of like technology, mm -hmm. right? It's so easy to pull out your phone and then realize three hours have passed. Um, it's hard to sit in silence for 30 minutes, right? When your mind's always go, go, go and active, it's hard to be like, I'm gonna stop now. I'm just gonna meditate or I'm gonna pray. Um, so I feel like that's why a good thing for me was like the car. Just, I'm not on my phone in the car. I'm not doing anything in the car. I've like muscle memory how to get to where I'm going. So it's just like, okay, this is my time to like fully connect with you. Mm -hmm. And of course the morning and the night's the same. Um, but I definitely saw it like when I was running Catholic Cardinals and things like that to just realize that people have a busy life. And if it's not one thing, it's another. And if it's nothing, it's just, I don't feel like it. And there's not much encouragement. And we've talked about this before, the kind of need for just instant gratification sometimes. And if I'm used to pulling out my phone and searching up an answer for homework, I'm gonna get that in a second. If I'm struggling in life and I pray right now and ask God for an answer, I'm not gonna get it in a second. It's hard for me to keep returning to that because I can turn to something that will give me an answer right away. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a lot of where I just, friends of mine have told me like they struggle because they're like, I don't hear him. Like he doesn't speak to me every day. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I wish, you know, like it's, it's a bit deeper than that. Um, so I've, I've seen that a lot in at least just youth um, to where they kind of feel that disconnect because they feel so connected everywhere else. Mm. I had thought about that and that, that parallel that way. And it is, it is a tough understanding that it's, uh, I'm, and I'm trying to remember who phrased it this way, but they said the, the we often, especially when we're younger, we think that prayer uh, and our disciplines are going to change the world. Mm -hmm. And they, they might have an impact. We don't, we don't know as much as what that can be. And intercessory prayer, right, that prayer of something that we need or someone else needs is something that uh, has a lot of benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but what they said is, more than worrying about how your prayer changes the world is how your prayer changes you. Mm -hmm. Because when you are thinking intentionally and, and going before God in that attitude, it's, and you're doing it for somebody else who is in need or for concern of the world, you're tuning yourself to those, those folks, mm -hmm. right? You are literally making your heart open to what's going on in their lives. And I think it, it builds empathy. It builds connection. It helps us feel that, you know, that div divine sense that all of us can share in through that kind of a practice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm not an athlete, so, uh, but I do know that as I was getting ready to go on my uh, sabbatical on, mm -hmm. the, on the trail, knowing that, having those small exercises that I was doing and doing and doing and doing uh, had long-term yeah, results. The consistency showing up. Yeah. Right, right. And the prayer is much more, there's a reason it's called a discipline, yeah. right? Because it's something you have to do all the time and it, it has slow, slow change over time, mm -hmm. but that change may not be external. Uh, it's, there's going to be a lot. you're expecting. Yeah. Right, or what you're expecting. It's, it's going to have much more of an internal. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, uh, why, why is this still important to you? Right? You know, so many, you were mm -hmm. just saying that like, so many young people, like they don't, they don't understand why, you know, or yeah. they struggle with it. Um, what has kept you connected? And, and where do you see it pay in your life? Yeah, I've just, for me, it's like I found comfort in it, you know, with so many kind of, outside anxieties. This is just something I've always felt comfortable with. And not to say it felt natural, but just something felt like homey about just being connected to the mm -hmm. faith. Um, and kind of going into this year, I've thought of like the Bible verse from Matthew with like, without cost you have received, so without cost you are to give. So that's been like every day on the mind of like, okay, knowing Jesus and knowing of Jesus is very different. Like everybody knows of Jesus, hopefully, right? Everybody's <laughs> heard, heard the name. Um, but truly knowing Jesus is like stepping into his shoes, mm -hmm. seeing what he saw, feeling what he felt, understanding what actually like happened instead of just like, oh yeah, I, I've heard the story before, but really Lent is kind of that example of 
live how Jesus lived. Of course, we're not 40 days in the desert, but some small thing might change us in a way that we didn't think it would, being mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, I'm giving something up in, in a sacrifice for God compared to, of course, what, what they did in fighting those temptations. Um, so kind of trying to think of, you know, I've been given this life, and it's kind of my job to now give and continue to kind of follow based on what I've been given, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, Lent is more of a challenge to describe to people, um, especially you, you mentioned the 40 days in isolation, uh, and so we'll unpack that just a second, mm -hmm. which is that um, when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, he is then um, compelled, driven, depending on how you want to translate it, into the desert for a time of solitude. Mm -hmm. For 40 days, which is where we get the 40 days that Lent reflects uh, as a time of, of fasting and then reflection and prayer. So many people feel isolated, even though we are so wired in, mm -hmm. right? Like we have all these different ways that we can connect, uh, but often at kind of superficial levels. Mm -hmm. So how do you think, and this is just your opinion, right? Mm -hmm. How do you think the idea of talking to people about isolating during Lent, uh, do you think that resonates? Do you think that's scary to people? Like, how, how does that translate, do you think, into a, a modern age? Yeah, I think it's tricky in the sense of, like, when I was in Catholic Cardinals, I would talk to students and be like, why do you feel disconnected, right? And why do you not want to jump in? Um, and, and, then, and it's literally the office you work in now is how do you yeah, how encourage, do you connected, encourage connection, right? right? Yeah. Um, and the response I always heard was like, if I do it wrong, I'm a bad Christian. And it was never the thought of like, if I don't do it at all, I'm a bad person. But it's like, if I mess up, mm. so if I give something up for 40 days mm -hmm. and I want to you know, read more, get off my phone, mm -hmm. if I mess that up, I'm a bad Christian mm. or I'm a bad Catholic compared to like, if I just don't give anything up at all, there's no like guilt of the, I'm not doing this right. Interesting. So that's kind of what I've heard from a lot of friends to be like, well, maybe I'm just not worthy in the sense of kind of getting that gratification uh, because maybe I'm not as committed as other people are committed. So it's kind of comparative in a sense as well. I, I was just having a conversation about this with kind of that internal guilt that we have mm -hmm. over when we don't fulfill our intentions. And it's one of those double-edged swords within Christianity, and I think other traditions too, where we don't have grace for ourselves and kindness for ourselves mm -hmm. like we would for others. Yeah. That we don't want to recognize that we're basically all hypocrites, mm -hmm. right? Our ideas and our values are aspirational no matter what tradition they're rooted in, mm -hmm. they're always something we're striving for and we will probably never fully attain. Yeah. So how do we how do we recognize, like, well, this is what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that I'm going to do it, but it's something I'm going to try. And there's, it's, uh, there's a loaded word in Christianity, sin, mm -hmm. um, that is often used as a, a, a cudgel Right, it is used as a weapon to, mm -hmm. to beat people into a more uh, holy life. Mm -hmm. And the word in the Greek is hamartia, which I'm probably mispronouncing, and it's hopefully my all those folks who actually know it right will forgive me. Um, but it, it comes from archery, and it means to miss the mark. Mm. And what we forget is... You know, you you miss a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Mm -hmm. But if you if you try, and you miss, it's okay. Yeah, you, you try again. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that idea of that these things are practice and repetition, and they help build us into those practices that we're we're still might miss the mark sometimes. But it doesn't mean we can't improve, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean when it doesn't go the way we expected or hoped, that we don't just say, well, that wasn't my best shot. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so 
I'm trying not to quote Hamilton here. It's really hard, but it's, it is that idea of like, you just, you just try it. Mm -hmm. and, and if it doesn't work out, that's okay. It's the intention of it that matters. You know, you might work to do a good thing for a person every day this, this next seven weeks, six, seven weeks. And there will be a day when you try to do something good and the other person does, yeah. right, doesn't receive it. It doesn't mean to not try. Yeah. It's just how can I maybe do a little better? Yeah, definitely. Do you have those places where, where um, you've been able to find that for yourself where it's like, well, I thought I was doing something. I thought I was helping. It didn't quite work out. How did you how did you lean into your faith in that kind of a moment when things didn't go the way you had hoped to to kind of pull it back together? Yeah, I feel like a lot of it was kind of my thought with running the Catholic Cardinals and being like, oh, I'm going to introduce all these things and give you all of these options. Um, and it even broke down to having like two separate meetings where like some people that like this stuff will just do this, other people that like this. Um, for that sense, it was like, okay, we're all going to, go over the readings, have like a nice meal together, and then we're going to go to church. Mm -hmm. And then it was a matter of like, well, nobody was coming to church. It was, like, it was, it was just a meal. So I was like, okay, well, then we'll have like a, just a fun game night where it's just a bunch of Catholics hanging out. Um, and then it was like kind of trying to introduce readings in scripture there, and then those mm -hmm. people stopped coming. So it was a matter of like kind of trying to read where people were at and being like, okay, maybe they just want someone like them to hang out with. They don't want dive into anything deep because again maybe there is some sort of tie or maybe they had a bad experience at one point in their life with the faith and they're like I'm trying to get back in but I don't want to dive in yet I want to mm -hmm. be introduced and then when I have my questions ready I'll ask them um, so it kind of took a lot of time praying and that to be like I'm trying various different routes not a lot is working what can I do next God and kind of trying to listen to be like well just be a person be there and then when the questions are there they'll ask them and if you have the answer answer them. If not, find them the answer. Try and help them get the answer because my worry was always that I wouldn't have the answer and I kind of turned someone away more because they're like, well, that wasn't what I wanted to hear. Thanks. And then go back into that abyss. So it's always been a big stress of mine, but kind of praying on that and providing what I can provide. Resources, books and stuff that I've like bought for the club and stuff like that. Just trying to be like, this worked for me. If I can't provide an answer, maybe find your own truth in this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that patience to let people be the experts on what they need mm -hmm. and to be a resource is very different than than some of us who were raised within a faith tradition, uh, and especially those of us who were trained a certain way. I probably just made a big thing on that. Uh, who were raised in a certain tradition and a certain approach. Uh, and I'm making this more about me today. I'm, I apologize oh, for that. But it's it. um, the, uh, the analogy I use is, you know, for 2,000 years, the church trained leaders to be shepherds. And we had shepherd tools. So we had like a sheepdog and a, a big hook and a, a stick. And, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, I'm gonna go lead my sheep out into the world and I have what I need. And somewhere in the past 30 years, um, we ended up not having any more sheep and all we had were cats. Mm. And if you try to use the same tools to herd cats that you use sheep, you will have no cats, yeah. right? You can't you can't catch them with anything. You can't send the dog to chase them. Like mm -hmm. it's just going to be chaos. Yeah. And what that helped me do is recognize that instead of trying to um, force people to go a certain way or to lead them a certain way, it was much more invitational to kind of entice them to a space where they would have what they were looking for, hopefully at the right time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you can take a sheep and put it in front of the grass and it will eat the grass. So you can take food and put it over the cat, the cat doesn't care. Mm -hmm. But if you just put the food out, and eventually yeah. the cat will say, you know what, I'm hungry. And it will, it will come and it will get what it needs from it. And so a lot of, of figuring out what people want now is much more, they've got so many ways they can engage. They got so many ways they can get resources. And some people feel tension about that. They're like, oh, they're supposed to do this, this, and this. It's like, well, they're experts on what they need. Mm -hmm. How do we just be invitational? Yeah, you know, definitely. how many times do we see Jesus going out and finding people? Yeah. No, it's people coming 
and asking him things. Uh, but it is, it is, um, it does cause those other questions of like, how can I do this better? What can I do more? How? Because yeah, there are people who are looking at us and they want numbers. Uh, uh, but to have that sense of, I'm, I might not, not everybody is ready for this. Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants this right now. How did you know you wanted this as part of your life? When, when, when did that switch kind of click for you to say, I want my faith life to be important throughout my life? Because it's, it's a choice, right? Yeah, it's real, sure. literally a choice we can make every day. Yeah. We can literally wake up and say, you know, this isn't working, I'm done. Um, what, what was that moment for you? So I was born and raised Catholic. I went to a Catholic school ever since like preschool all the way up to eighth grade and then public high school, which was kind of like the first I feel like, option to be like, I want to opt out, right? Um, but kind of found groups and clubs that I still connected with that were still practicing the faith and then kind of took that into college and was welcomed into Catholic Cardinal. So I kind of always had an open opportunity to like have the faith accessible. So I always stuck with it. There was never a time where I was like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've questioned things, and everybody I feel like does, um, especially at certain times. But kind of always looking back, I always found God active in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've given focus talks on kind of where I've been like, oh, this is terrible. Like, this is worst case scenario. And then God being like, try this. And then, as you know, I keep trying things every day now. Um, so I never really had like the aha moment just because I've always found comfort in it. And I've never had the moment to be like, I'm done to where I needed to turn back. Of course, I've been like stronger in my faith and weaker in my faith at times. Um, but I feel like at least at the current moment, I'm kind of on the stronger end of things. And I, again, have done like Procedo and other things that kind of kept that flame lit. Um, so yeah. Do you want to give a quick unpack what Crucio is? You might have a better explanation for no, it. No, no. Um, what was your experience of it? Um, so, yeah, Crucio is kind of, there's men and female groups of it, and it's where a group of maybe 30 to 40, I think it's the average group size, um, go away on a weekend, and it's fully at a retreat house where you stay there, have all meals together, uh, full of grown men singing and talking God, and people just kind of giving presentations on deity and kind of how to live out your faith and how to bring others to the faith. Um, pretty much the sense of like how to be fishermen of men, right? Mm -hmm. How to continue pushing out God's word and continue letting people know who God is, how to connect with God, um, and kind of the ways to live out your faith on a daily basis. So that's what I got from it. No, that's a great explanation. That that intentionality of a weekend retreat, so it can really yeah. be powerful. Uh, well, we're uh, coming to the end of our time today, and I was teasing before we came in that I might ask you a gotcha question, uh, but I'm not going to uh, because hopefully, uh, you know, I, we recognize audiences. But I did want to give you an opportunity. Uh, we've had lots of great conversations over the five plus years that we've known each other now. Yeah. Um, is there a question at this point that you would ask of me? Mm. What's been the hardest part about living out your faith? I know it's a, a deep question, but I'm sure there's yeah, kind of been the reoccurring one where you're like, this keeps coming back to me, where it's, I know we've talked before about like parts of the faith that we question, or maybe yeah. be like, maybe I don't understand this, or maybe it hasn't been explored deep enough, but do you have something that you kind of always return back to, and you're like, this part always stumps me? Um, I think I'll, I'll lift up, um, what in theology we call theodicy, which in most people understand is why do bad things happen to good people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the hardest things, especially as a pastor when I was serving in churches, um, was seeing people who were really having a hard time, mm -hmm. who were thrown into real suffering, um, who and I think any neutral observation did not deserve it. Mm -hmm. And when I was first a pastor, there was a young man who was part of our congregation who had a daughter who was three, and the daughter and the mom were in a car wreck and uh, ended up that the child was um, suffered a traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. and so was pronounced brain dead. And to go into a space with two 
young 20 year olds mm -hmm. and this now, uh, you know, this, this formerly beautiful three year old mm -hmm. um, and to be in that space with them uh, was very challenging. And, it, and whenever we have those traumas in our own lives, it can also often trigger mm -hmm. that questioning and I think most of us are in a space where we can process through what it means for us to hold on to our faith or to, you know, be angry and, and process through. But as someone who is tasked to care for others, that's even more challenging. Mm -hmm. It's like it's easier to understand why I might be going through this. It's much harder watching somebody else. Yeah. And so that one, that one always throws me off. Mm -hmm. um, it, but it, the flip side of that is it gives me a lot of, of empathy mm -hmm. and a lot of space uh, as people are going through that to recognize that pain mm -hmm. and to be okay as they are wrestling with it and what that might mean for them. And, and finally, to just give them the space to, again, uh, figure out what that's going to mean for them mm -hmm. and not, not judge them in it, not question just to be present, yeah, and, and so, so yeah, that's that's one where it always hits hits uh, deep. Yeah. So thank you for that. I appreciate it, uh, and for for the way that you're being intentional and showing up for people in the midst of daily lives and pains. I hope that the the forty days of Lent, uh, where you're making a little difference in everybody's world, uh, it really goes well for you. And uh, I hope other so folks well. can do it too. <laughs> so thanks so much. Yeah, Have a, a blessed 40 days and thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks so much for uh, making time to, uh, to spend with us today as we were in conversation. Uh, hopefully you'll take a moment to watch some of our other videos and conversations as part of the Faith and series. If you do have a moment, take a, a time to comment, ask a question, leave a like. All those things help us. And if there's something you'd like us to see a, a discuss, uh, leave a comment so we can explore those. We thank you and we'll see you next time.